If Jesus walks close to my side, our Lord will return to this earth some sweet day. Our troubles will then all be o'er. The Master so gently will lead us away beyond that dust heavenly shore. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in his great love. From all harm safe in his sheltering arm, I'm living by faith. I'll be reading from Ecclesiastes 2, verses 1 through 11. I said to myself, Come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness, and what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly. My mind still guided me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers, a harem, as well as the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me, and all this wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, Everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity we have to come here and, and worship you, put the things from our daily lives behind us and, and think only of, of you and, and what you have done for us. Father, we hope that the service today will be uplifting to us all and, and to you. Um, be with um, the speaker this morning, and as they have studied, we hope they um, can say the words we need to hear to, to open, open our minds and open our hearts to, to share your word with others. Father, thank you for um, all you've done for this congregation. We Hope that you continue to be with the progress of, of the selling of the building. Hope that'll go through soon and, and uh, we can get finished with the, with the new building and move into that. Father, be with everyone as they're traveling through the holiday season. Um, please keep them safe. Be with those who are, w are away from their families um, during this time, those who are in school or those who are traveling, your TJ and Ahanu and, and uh, Kayla, and, and please help them to, to be safe. Thankful for um, Carol and Diane's wise, wise is, um, surgery going well. We're thankful to see uh, Diane here this morning. Father, help us to, to show others um, your word, Father. Help us to be examples. Help us to to be honorable and, and uh, help us to be men of integrity and, and respectful of others, respectful of our families, and to put you first in our lives, Father. Father, just thank you for all you've given us. Be with those who are sick. We've had a run of flu going through our congregation. We ask that you'd be with everyone. 
get them through this all right and give them the strength to come back to us. Be with Lonnie and and uh, hope she's doing well and she got her heart uh, in a good rhythm and she can come back to us. Father, forgive us of our sins and guide us through this day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 20, two zero. <clears throat> Sing the first and last verses. Two zero. Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. Praise him, angels in the high. Sun and moon rejoice before him. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. On high his power proclaim Heaven and earth and all creation Lord and magnify his name Hallelujah, amen 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 432 After this song, we'll join each other all together in the partaking of the Lord's Supper, the communion together. So let's uh, try to concentrate our minds on that event, remembering the cross and the very Son of God giving himself for us. 432. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain Free to all a healing stream Flows from Calvary's mountain In the cross, in the cross Be my glory Beyond the river. 
To prepare our minds uh, for the Lord's Supper, in just a moment I'm going to be reading from the scriptures. Uh, first of all, from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, uh, following that, First uh, Peter, uh, chapter 2, starting at verse 21. You know, out, outside of Christ, mankind is permanently and hopelessly lost and separated from God. And Scripture teaches us that this is, of course, uh, because of the sin that burdens mankind and the fact that that sin is so heinous uh, to God and incompatible uh, with the very nature of God. And it's when we're baptized into Christ that we're able to bridge this great divide, this chasm that separates us uh, from uh, God. And is that because we no longer sin as Christians? And I think we all know that most definitely that is not the case, but rather uh, the sacrifice of Christ uh, through his death on the cross, uh, in that act he took all our sins upon himself and became the object of, of sin in the eyes of God so that we could have everlasting salvation. So. I'd like to go back to scripture, prophet Isaiah, chapter 53. I'm going to read that entire chapter at this time. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought, us pe- that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. Because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting with verse 21. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you are like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Pray with me, please. Our Father in heaven, Uh, Once again, we come before you to remember the sacrifice of your son 
We're overwhelmed and speechless with this awesome act. At this time, we pray that we will partake of this bread and remember his body that died on the cross and the great sacrifice and salvation that was brought to mankind as a result of this. Please help us to do this in a manner that is pleasing to you and appropriately humble. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Father in heaven, we continue our prayer and our communion with you and remembering this great sacrifice and the fact that the blood of Christ represented by this cup is the only thing that washes away our sins. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.
turn to 381. <clears throat> this song, of course, is about family, the, the family of God, and much of our offering is uh, for that purpose, to benefit the family and the work of God. Many of the examples you can think of in the New Testament of the reasons for offering were to help out brethren who were suffering from famine or some other kind of need, and then for the apostles and missionaries to go out. So that is the primary purpose of us having our offering. But not only that, it's because that's what God ordered and commanded us to do. And even uh, for paying for a building, uh, this is for us so that we can have a comfortable place to come to do God's work. So keep those things in mind as you're thinking about your offering and what we're going to do next. Let's start on the right-hand page with the verse. 381. You will notice we say brother and sister around here. It's because we're a family and these folks are so near. When one has a heartache, we all share the tears and rejoice in each victory in this family so dear. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. From the door of an orphanage to the house of the king, no longer an outcast, a new song I sing. From rags unto riches, from the weak to the strong, I'm not worthy to be here, but praise God I belong. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. In just a minute, I'm going to be reading from the second chapter of Acts. As, as Rick so ably pointed out, uh, we now have this privilege as well as this command uh, to give of our means uh, to support uh, the work of the church. And I'm always careful to point out that if you're a visitor, uh, this is not a time to get uh, uneasy. Uh, we're, we're not soliciting any funds from you at all. Uh, we would appreciate it if you take the time to maybe fill out a visitor's card and drop it in the plate. Uh, but this this uh, service, part of the service, is for the members uh, to support the cause of the Lord uh, in this particular community. Um, I'm always personally encouraged by going back to the example of the church in its infancy and their spirit of giving, and I always pray that uh, I uh, will have that uh, type of joy in my heart as I give. Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. 
everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All of the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Our Father in heaven, at this time we, we thank you for all of the wonderful blessings that have been bestowed upon us, and we, we thank you for the privilege and opportunity of, of the giving of our means. We hope that you will uh, be with each and every one of us and help us to do this uh, from the heart uh, in a proper manner uh, to contribute to the cause of Christ in this community. It's in, in his name that we always pray. Amen. Number 539, if you would mark that song, it would be the song after the lesson, 539, 539. <clears throat> and let's turn to 548 for a song right now before the lesson. There's a happy day of promise over in the great beyond Where the saved of earth shall soon the glory share Where the souls of men shall enter and live on forevermore Everybody will be happy over there Everybody will be happy will be happy over there. We will shout and sing his praises. Everybody will be happy over there. There we'll meet the one who saved us and who kept us by his grace and who brought us to that land so bright and fair. We will praise his name forever as we look upon his face. Everybody will be happy over there. Everybody will be happy, will be happy over there. We will shout and sing his praises. Everybody will be happy over there. The scripture reading today will be from Luke chapter uh, 
9, verses 49 through 56. Luke 9, 49 through 56. John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because, he's, because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not stop him, for he, for the one who is not against you is for you. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he, returned, but he turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen means it's true, or in, a, in another way, I agree. So it's a proclamation of affirmation. That you appreciate what was just read, and you agree, and it's true. Okay, everybody breathe in. Breathe out. Relax. Relax. Not that much, Barry. <laughs> Barry said, I could do that. I won't hear much of the lesson, but I could do No. Um, it's November 15th? 16th. Relax. A month from now, things might be more hectic for you. And you'll either have missed this time of relaxation or you'll have started the ball rolling. You know, uh, the, the fact that Christmas music was being played in the stores as long as two weeks ago it just had me shaking my head. We should deliberately be people who take life with, with more uh, purpose and rest and not let the hectic nature run us day to day to day. Don't say yes to too many things. Protect your family time. Get plenty of sleep. Get plenty of sleep. Let the Lord guide your schedule, not the series of parties or get-togethers or the have to buy this thing or get that dinner ready or whatever. Fellowship with people in a relaxed way that, uh, you know, who knows, we might be moving. <laughs> there is no specific update on the building sale or on progress. There's no news. I wish I could say something. Uh, we're still in the window in which the potential buyer is looking at things. Uh, I'm sure all of his financing and everything else that he's got, um, but there's also inspections to know and legal matters to settle, so we don't have any update on those things. But, um, uh, you know, we have that blessing uh, potentially coming. Just wanted us to, as a, as a family, not let the busyness of the season start to run us or overwhelm us. For we serve a father who is not of this world. We should walk at a pace that he gives us and not let all the things and all the schedules and all the have-tos overwhelm us. There's only one have-to, and that's glorify God with your life. There's only one need, and that's maintain your close and loving relationship with your Heavenly Father. So don't let all the other important things run you, but relax and live for His purpose. I know many have been sick, uh, and some who were not able to come last Wednesday night asked me if, if, uh, if there's another way to see the Thailand um, uh, presentation that I gave, and I decided we're going to go ahead and do it at the 1220 class, which 
We'll start a little bit earlier today, so if you want to see uh, pictures from Thailand and hear uh, some of the events that happened uh, on my last trip to Thailand, uh, we'll be doing it today at 1220. We're going to talk about a little bit about the Christian worldview today. We're talking a little bit about politics today and see what it is that maybe God would have us learn in this muddy, complicated business. I want to make it practical. I want to make it useful. We just finished um, a political time. Uh, just last night I, I heard that uh, there had been some resolution in, in other Alaskan uh, 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 voting competitions uh, to see who might have won or didn't. Um, I don't really know how all those came out. But God has us, does give us a particular way to approach this world, to approach our government, and to approach our community as uh, political thinkers, as uh, people with a perspective. Let's go to our Father in prayer before we do that. Lord and Father, you are truly awesome. We praise you and pray that we can learn uh, properly how to walk, how to live, uh, how to love, how to keep first things first. Father, help us keep first things first. Let the important always be clear in front of us. Help us to know right and wrong. Very simple thing to say, Father, but it gets very complicated uh, as fog and confusion and different points of view uh, come across our mind uh, to know sometimes what is right and what is the wrong. And is there a right and a wrong choice right in front of us? Or is it just an opinion of ours? Father, give us wisdom in these things, that we can be uh, children of yours, uh, uplifting your son, giving glory to your beautiful name, uh, giving a voice to your gospel uh, and life in our lives to the path and the walk of your son. Please help us as we look at your word, Father, to understand these things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We just had an election. You might have had an opinion about the election. I hope you voted. I think Christians should be voting. I think to get the, to get, uh, I trust you. I trust you with your opinion and uh, with your look at the candidates and your look at the issues. Uh, so, so please stay active. Don't let cynicism or bitterness or other worldly ideas enter your life and heart. If you choose not to vote, do it for a godly reason, not because you have some uh, cynical view of, of politics or of government, uh, but do it for a, a reason, a purpose. Christian worldview is something that we should have established as a way we approach our life. Uh, a Christian, you could spend a, a, your, the rest of your life uh, figuring out what the Christian worldview is. But at the very least, it starts with a sovereign God. God is, first of all. Hebrews 11, absolutely. God is. Hebrews 11, 6. And God is sovereign, which means he rules. Our God is not anemic or weak or distant, but he's active sovereign, caring, engaging, even if in the crimes of this world, even in, if in the, in the difficulties of, of war and of other atrocities going around the world, you want to you uh, grip your hands and say, God, where are you in these things? He's right there. He, his interaction with our free will is a, is a tough thing to understand sometimes because he absolutely lets us choose. But you can understand the, the, some of the things that have happened to this world because of the last two big wars. The, the great big wars of we called World War I and II changed the landscape of this world and changed the way we think and changed the way our governments work and changed the way the world works. Some of it to, very much to the better. And you say, God, did all, that, did all that pain, was it necessary? Well, for us to come back to him, he understands those things. So now we have other pains going on. So we trust our God as a sovereign God. Daniel 4, turn to Daniel for a minute. Let's look at a couple of things in Daniel about God to understand what, what, who he is and what government is in his hand. 
Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4, verse 34. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honor him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are, are counted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or to him say, what have you done? First of all, God has a kingdom. He had one when Nebuchadnezzar was saying these things, and he has one now. Now we have a little bit more uh, intimate connection with his kingdom as, as in the, the fact that the church is part of God's kingdom here and now to everyone baptized into Christ. Everyone in Christ is a part of God's kingdom. So God is a king. He has put his son on the throne of that kingdom who reigns there now. But God is a king and he rules and he rules actively. No one can stop his hand. Uh, look at verse um, 17 of uh, or Daniel 4. This is a sentence. This sentence is by decree of the angelic watchers, and the decision is a command of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind, and he bestows it on whom he wishes and sets over it the lowest of, lowliest of men. God rules. He rules over mankind. The Bible clearly teaches that. So as we get frustrated or thrilled with this government or that government, remember there is a real ruler, a permanent ruler, that we have a perspective. The, the Christian worldview establishes that God is in charge. And all this temporary stuff is just that. It's temporary. Some of it goes great. And some of it goes worse than you could describe. But it's all temporary. And there is a just king watching over the whole thing. Justice will be done. We don't, we don't uh, have to have everything just now. We want justice to happen. We have a perspective on what justice is and isn't. But it's not going to work out. The best governments ever couldn't do uh, things in correct justice. He, they couldn't figure out all the right and wrong. Every government you've ever known has gotten it wrong. And every government you've ever known has gotten some things right. Daniel chapter 2. Look, look at Daniel 2 verse 21 while you're there. It is he who changes the times and epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. God is active in the governing of men. Kingdoms do not rise or fall without his knowledge, without his presence, without his action. It doesn't mean that every king and every leader is, is pleasing to God. It doesn't mean that God has chosen this person to be in charge of that country and that person to be in charge of that country, although he has. It means that that is what he does. Uh, whether he always does that or not is up to uh, discussion. The fact is, he does it, and he doesn't look away uh, as who's running our kingdoms. Jesus taught us in regard to the kingdom to seek it first. Seek first the kingdom, right? Matthew 6, 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and everything else will be taken care of. And that's probably a good basic step on how to live our lives and how to approach uh, political things, how to approach your job, how to approach your health, how to approach your church family, how to approach the love uh, and difficulties in your marriage, that you seek first 
God's kingdom and God's righteousness and let him handle the other things. You seek that first. You put that in front of everything you are and everything you do. Okay, first part of our worldview is that God is and he is sovereign. Second part of our worldview is that God is good. God is good. For the Lord, is, Lord God is good and his loving kindness endures forever. Psalm 100 uh, verse 5. God works all things for good to men who love him. Our God is a good God. And he acts toward that goodness. Third part of our Christian worldview is that God has created the universe. It was all created for a purpose, and as far as we can tell, uh, his relationship with us is central to that purpose, because that's what he talks about through the rest of the Bible in regard to his creation. God created everything, and he has put his relationship with us in, in, in a central place, to that creation he has made us you can make this 2a or 3 he has made us in his image therefore there is a value to people when our founding documents say that all men are created equal we have as a basis for our government a value of every human being even if our own government got it wrong and still gets it wrong in so many ways at least it stands and, and, and attempts to say that the principle is every human is precious and valuable. And it's because we are made in God's image. We take our value from the one who has all value. You see, that's how real value is established. Why is a human life valuable? Because it's made by God. It's given to us by God. But more than just the life is valuable, the entire essence of the person, because it's eternal, is valuable. And we have free will. We are free to choose. We are free to choose. The Bible shows us that from the very beginning to the very end. We are not compelled. We are not stuck. We are free to choose you walked in the voting booth a couple of weeks ago and you could choose this candidate or that candidate you could walk in that booth or not walk in that booth you could have eggs for breakfast or cereal for breakfast you are free to choose and you know it despite all the ide religious ideas and all the evolutionary ideas that say that it's all predetermined and predestined and it's all built in your DNA you don't have a free no you know you have a freedom to choose and those principles are key and central to whatever else you want to build around your worldview. God is. He is sovereign. He is good. You can add loving to the good because uh, uh, the verses say that too. The universe was made by him. You are made in his image. You have freedom of choice. You have free will. Add to that that the word... Uh, that the Bible is his word and Jesus is his son through whom we have salvation and you have rounded out and, and established a solid Christian worldview. Therefore, you can take all sorts of things and filter it through those ideas and see what rises to the top as deserving your time and effort and attention. God made three things, three institutions after he made us in the universe. The first institution is marriage. It's the very first thing he did with mankind he got a man and a woman and he put them together in marriage the very first relationship he created was uh, marriage the second th relationship he created was what you'd have to say is it, it, it built but it was nation and government the aspect that, that a, a group of people needs governed I was reading a book recently, uh, guys, who said that if we didn't have our ladies around us, we, we would we'd be, we'd be in miserable shape. They, they have kept us civil. They keep us looking forward to things. Uh, they have established a reason for, uh, for organization, for, uh, for cooperation, uh, that if it was just us guys and God, and God had uh, men falling out of trees as, you know, as they were created or whatever it was, we'd, we'd, we'd be a mess. 
that the kindness, the love, the coordination, the civility, the care, even the sense of, of cooperative government and the reason for defense and watching over things comes because we have these beautiful ladies uh, that live with us in our lives, uh, that, that through them our children are born, and that entire structure needs to be cared for and protected. Uh, we'd be sitting around fires, hitting each other over the head with sticks and hunting all the time. And yeah. I won't say who gave me that amen. God gave us family. He gave us nation and government. And third, he gave us his church. That's the third uh, institution that he created uh, specifically as a lasting uh, institution for us. And in regard to these institutions, in teaching the church, let's look at a very common verse. You know this verse, Romans 13. Let's look at this and understand a bit of how God wants us to think about uh, these institutions. For every person, Hebrews, I'm excuse, Romans, let's try Romans. I said that once, didn't I? Romans chapter 13, verse 1. I need another sip of water, obviously. Every person is to be subject or in subjection to the governing authority, for there is no authority except from God, and those which, are, which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have, have, oppo have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause to fe of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear from authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God for you, for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. It is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Rem render to all that is due them, tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Well, there's a nice succinct description of our relationship with government. Government is here to organize things, to keep order, to keep rules, regulations, laws out in front of us, not for our salvation, but for our peace, for our order, for things to be done properly. You do not want uh, to live in a community without a police department. You do not want to live in a, in a county or a state, uh, a borough, without government. You will have chaos, and it won't take very long before uh, you get that extreme chaos. And you can look back over history of, of, of areas and communities in which governments were turned upside down and lost their, lost their power. Even today, there's anarchy in certain corners of our world because the government has been destroyed or left ineffective there. Yeah, I want government, but I want them to do what I want to do. That's the problem. They're doing what other people... It doesn't say that. In fact, the government that Paul is describing here, or using as a background here, is the Roman government, in which taxes were heavy, and taxes were often used for quite immoral purposes. An oppressive, atheistic government, or a, a polytheistic government, if you want, one that, that held up many gods, or the, or the emperor is God, quite anti-Christian. A government that eventually would be trying to, to destroy the church is the one being held up here as one you're supposed to be in subjection to. What? God wants me to, su to, to submit to a government that's going to end up trying to destroy me and my faith? Yes, to be blunt. Because you need the order. Because God's got the bigger issues fixed. Yeah, but what about me and my property and running for my life? Well, yeah, that's difficult. 
But in that, God has you also. So, we're supposed to be people who obey the law, who live peaceful, supportive, uh, uncomplaining lives. It doesn't mean we agree, and it doesn't mean we're silent about moral and, and difficult issues uh, or, or and ungodly issues going on in our government. But it does mean that, one, we don't wring our hands over it, and two, we don't fight in, uh, in uh, abusive ways against the government. I'm not saying that there's no, never a reason to change governments or, or to upgrade governments. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 13. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as to one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves for Christ bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Did you catch that middle part? That our behavior under even a corrupt government is to be so honorable that God will be glorified. That they'll listen to our message about Christ. You may silence the ignorance of foolish men. That people will learn to appreciate who Jesus is because of how we act politically and socially. But once again, uh, we are to submit ourselves to all these institutions around us, all of these governmental authorities around us. Now, Riley read for us out of Luke. And I know we have all said, we're going to be in Luke chapter 9, we have all thought and all said, Man, I just wish we had a Christian fill-in-the-blank. Mayor, president, legislature, governor, just fill-in-the-blank. I wish we had somebody there with my moral perspective, with, who was a, a devoted follower of Christ, so that, that Christian principles would be uh, leading our country. And I think that's right and good and noble. Just don't take it too far. Or maybe the better way to say it is be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you wish for. Luke chapter 9, Jesus teaches us some significant things about power and religious authority and where you want a religious rule uh, to be. What we really want is that the laws of our land and the laws of our God match each other. That's what you really want. That lying still is something a wrong, that, that harming people or violating them or their property is something that's going to be end, land in court and people are going to have to answer for it and it's going to be punished and stopped. That's what you really want, that, that all people, all people are treated with respect and dignity and, and have a right to life, have a right to freedom, have a right to liberty, have a right to voice, have a right to, to faith. This is part of the reason that, that the damage being done to our unborn children in this, in this Western world, around the world, is so heinous. It's because there's an entire segment of our society that is not being treated as a precious human being. That's the, the wrong of abortion. That God created humans don't have a right to voice and liberty and freedom. See, all people are created by God. All people. There isn't a bunch of different races on this globe. There's only one race. And if, if the Christian church had had that right for the last 2,000 years, we would have a very different world today. But the church followed social norms on their view of race and bought in to a lot of the Darwinistic lies of the 1800s in how to treat people and what the different races meant. And we quickly began, began to ca categorize people as Asians and Europeans and Africans and, 
and uh, South Americans and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we, and we divided people up into these different racial categories. There's only one race. You can be sure of that. If, if nothing else, just imagine lining up all the people of the earth from, by racial characteristics. And you'd be walking along, somebody saying, well, these, these are Asians. I can tell these are Asians. These are, these, this, that, that guy's not an Asian, but this whole section, I have no idea who these people are. These, are, these folks are from South America. I can see, you know, the, uh, the Aztec back, and then, then you go, and you go, I have no idea who these people are. You see that on that continuum, you cannot, you cannot differentiate everybody on this earth into racial categories. You can't do it. You never could. And to take some sort of extreme uh, person of this uh, a facial structure or of this skin coloring or of that hairstyle or of that whatever it is and say well that's this race and that's this race and that's that race it's all wrong and it's not scriptural and it's not biblical and it doesn't it, it doesn't account for God's creation of all of us can we all intermarry can we all create children in our marriage absolutely now we have different ethnic backgrounds we have different nationalities but we've created that not God. Not God. Where was I? Luke 9. Got sidetracked. Master, verse 49, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he does not, fo does not follow along with us. Jesus said, do not hinder him, for he who is not against you is for you. And the next story is about uh, a village in Samaria who would not cooperate with Jesus' disciples, basically threw them out of town, would not receive them. They, they took note that they were heading to Jerusalem and they didn't want anything to do with people going to Jerusalem. Part of that uh, uh, judgmentalism and, and separatism they had of those days. And so what did James and John want to do? Lord, do you want us to command fire down from heaven to consume them? So here's two situations. One in which there's a man who's taking actions in the name of Jesus, but not according to the apostles or the disciples' uh, pattern or, or part of their uh, uh, structure or under Jesus' teaching. The, the guy may have been speaking incorrectly. He may have been teaching incorrectly. Who knows what he was doing? But he wasn't part of them. And Jesus said, you leave him alone. You leave him alone. But this town won't accept us. We could have it destroyed. I know you've got the power from heaven to do that. Let's destroy the... You leave them alone. You see, religious perspective in political power doesn't end up being very pretty. And we have repeated it hundreds of times through the centuries. Putting religious thinking people in political power all of a sudden, religious dogma becomes the political objective, not the protection and care and freedom of the people. God honors men's free will. He doesn't want compulsive faith. He's clear about that. He doesn't want religious choices punished with political and physical power. Because we're going to get it wrong. We always have, from the very men walking with Jesus, we've gotten it wrong. We've gotten it wrong. But they're not doing it our... You leave them alone. But those people... You leave them alone. Political power in religious hands is a very, very difficult thing to balance. Would I love? Should you love? Should we work? Should we vote? Should we elect? Should we nominate? Should we push for laws that parallel God's laws and God's will? Absolutely. Amen. A hundred percent. 
Does that include taxes? Yeah, I don't know. Does that include health care? Do I have strong opinions about national health care? Yes, I do. Is health care good? Yeah. Is government supplied health care good? <coughs> I'm getting military retirement. I'm <coughs> yes, as a matter of fact, it works pretty well. What kind of duplicitous person would I be to say, I've got mine, but the next person doesn't. You see, you've got to be careful. Should we be careful about laws like that? Absolutely. Heavy tax is a good idea? I don't think so. No tax is a good idea? God himself said, you need to pay taxes because that civil servant needs to have his income because he's doing God's work. Or at least the government is doing God's work. Should we help poor folks, underprivileged people, people who can't work? Well, yes. How much? Oh, I don't know. Do you? What if we put the program in your hands? Well, no, I don't want to run the program. I just want it run better. Well, I think all those things we should have clear opinions about, but they're not necessarily opinions of faith. And having a religious worldview does not necessarily make you fit into this category of taxes or this category of health care or this category of welfare or this category of national defense. Christians and non-Christians can have a wide spectrum of ideas of all those things. Had, had one brother here come to me years ago and said, do you have to be a Republican to be a Christian? And I said, oh, brother, I'm sorry. No, you do not. He said, well, it sure sounds like that around here sometimes. This was 10 years ago, a long time ago. I said, yeah. I said, you know, some of the moral issues rise to the top. He said, I absolutely understand abortion and, and uh, other things. He said, but let me tell you the way my father was treated by the Republican businessmen of the town I grew up in. Those men were so corrupt and he began to give me story after story after story of his father's treatment, of his town's treatment by people of a certain political party. And now as a mature man, he chooses Christ and he's walking in Christ, but he knows his political thinking and he knows he hates corruption and he knows what, what and he, th and it's not black and white. It is definitely not black and white. Government safety regulations? Absolutely. But don't make them too restrictive because I want to have fun. Helmet laws? I mean, you just keep going and going and going. And, and some Christians plant their flags, uh, political flags, in some very strange places. I'm not talking about you all, but you know the, the, the spectrum of Christian thinking out there uh, ends up with some very strange ideas. You can be a libertarian, you can be a conservative, uh, you can be uh, socially aggressive, you can be all sorts of things and, and serve uh, Jesus Christ with heart and focus and honor. Moral issues such as uh, protecting babies. How can that be wrong? How can protecting babies, born or unborn, ever fall in the category of being judgmental and wrong? And yet it does. Cloning humans for tissue transplants? Uh, I think we should have some clear moral opinions of what to do with health and what to do with things like euthanasia and what to do with uh, uh, drug use. But that becomes even its own difficulty because drug use is legal and proper and, and appropriate from a medical doctor. And there's a lot of drugs that are allowed in our lives off the shelves and uh, and out of the stores. We've now brought marijuana in to be legal in this state, and now we have a, 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 a kind of conundrum of how do we handle this new uh, mind-affecting uh, thing uh, uh, that some people say f fits this way and some people say fits that way. I have an opinion. I have an opinion. If it affects your thinking, it affects the way you treat, you treat people or treat uh, uh, thoughts and, 
and ideas. If it affects uh, your mind, you don't get into it. You leave it alone, legal or not. That's what drunkenness is all about. While the, while the word of God warns us of what, it's to stay away from alcohol and to stay away from drunkenness, it's because it affects us. It affects our thinking. And it's not right. God wants us to be clear-minded, clear-thinking, focused people. I've got all sorts of stories I've been cutting out and saving about, about people who have been uh, uh, under the effects of marijuana and how apathetic and weak it makes their day and their thinking and how hard it is to get rid of it and set it aside. Now, we shouldn't have anything to do with smoking marijuana ourselves, but as you can imagine, the, the legality of it in personal use becomes a long and a difficult uh, series of decisions we have to make. So what do we do with all this? What do we do with all this? We praise God. We serve his kingdom. And we appreciate the place he's given us to live. And we thank him for our government. And we pray for our kings and presidents and governors and officials. And we cooperate with them and give them honor and respect and fight for, for honorable laws that lift up uh, the dignity of man that lift up the, the integrity and the, and the precious value of the individual, that we protect families. That's one of my passions. I wish our laws were more protective of family and marriage. But we have laws that encourage divorce, that encourage breakup, that encourage children be born without uh, two parents at home. Uh, and, and, and we should uh, change and affect those laws in a way that, that takes away that encouragement. We should... Uh, be people who work hard at being law-abiding. Check back on your taxes to make sure you paid what you should be paying, that you're not uh, manipulating things. Because this isn't our home. This isn't our home. We get to go home one day to be with Dad, to be with our Father, to be with our brother Jesus Christ, and to spend a glorious eternity. And I don't want us to leave here with regrets on how we treated people, saying, I, I shouldn't have made that such a big issue. Why did I get so angry about whatever it was, those things that affected my property values? Boy, I got mad at my neighbors in the way they affected my property value. Let's glorify God. Let's honor Christ with our lives. If there's any here this morning that have not been baptized into him, uh, I, I want you to uh, follow Nick's example. Nick was uh, baptized last Sunday. If you haven't met our new brother, uh, Nick Anderson, he's here today. Uh, meet him. But if there's any ready to be baptized today, we invite you to take that step now. Or at least start the Bible study to find out what it is that God asks you to do and what his word teaches. If you have that need or any need, please come forward and let us know while we stand and sing. Friends.
tell me that no tears ever come again. In the lovely land of uncrowded day, oh, the land of cloudless day, oh, the land of an uncrowded sky, oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an uncrowded day. Have a seat, please. Brianna Baldwin has stepped forward. She's been back for a, a couple of months now, moving back up to Alaska. And she comes forward saying that she is uh, very tired and sick of the life that she's been living and the choices she's been making. She says, I want to walk right. I want to live right. I want to choose right. I don't like what I've been doing. And I don't like the choices I've been making. And I said, your church family loves you. You want some help? She says, yes, I do. I said, there's some ladies out there who really reach out to you and love you a lot. You want their help? And she said, yeah. And your brothers love you. They're willing to help. And so she said, yes, I want their help. So uh, let's pray together now for Brianna. Satan has all sorts of trips, tripwires out there to catch us in, uh, and we need each other badly uh, to make it safe through this life. So let's pray for Brianna, and let's rally around her and her family to help her. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can always come home to you. We thank you that your arms are always open. Please help us with your family here in the valley to have your arms open for Brianna, uh, through the struggles and pains that she has had in her life. We pray for your forgiveness for her. Forgiveness for her, that we can stand with you uh, to lift her up, uh, to give her a safe place to walk, uh, a clearly lighted path in front of her. We can give her the strength not to uh, believe Satan's lies and to uh, fall into his trap. We pray for the strength of her family, uh, that they can uh, support her and rally around her, that uh, they can find peace in their home and peace in their relationship. Let's pray together. Our God and our Father, it's a privilege to be known as your children, to be protected by your love, to be known by your honesty, to be encouraged by your hope. So as we come and we spend this time together, we hope that each of us both individually and all of us collectively are encouraged, are strengthened, and are comforted by our time together so that we can go through our time apart with courage, with honesty, with strength. We come to you and, and we know that there are, this life is not a perfect place or you wouldn't have promised heaven to us. There are struggles, there are health issues, there are accidents, there are injuries, there is death. It's all a part of this life but it's not a fun thing to have. We ask your hand in ours that we can endure, that we can walk through these things knowing we have a better home, a better place, and a better family in eternity that we can take from this life with us. We, we know that people have had surgeries. We know that people have sudden health problems. We know that people have problems of will, problems of faith. These are not good things, 
but we ask your hand and we ask our help strengthening and encouraging these people and if it be your will we'll all succeed we'll all walk through this life better than without us we ask you to forgive us of our sins we don't want to sin but we know we do we ask you to give us the strength to persevere and to walk in your hand and your light we ask you to go with us through our life and through the remainder of this day and on throughout and in a few moments we're going to have a, a, a time that we've set aside to be together to share a meal and to share time and friendship and fellowship we'd ask that you would bless all that as we pray in your son's name amen Well, howdy. Good to see you all. A couple of prayer updates and calendar updates for you. <clears throat> Let's see. We're going to start uh, with Diane Wise and Carol Bradley. Both had surgeries this past week, but in different states. Diane is with us uh, today. Carol's surgery was in California, so if you want to visit her, you might want to wait until she comes back. Uh, but it seems both surgeries went well, and so we're thankful for that. Uh, this morning at 3 a.m., Leilani Bolas was uh, in the hospital with a, her heart rate was, was racing. Um, but they got it back to normal with a defibrillator, so pray for Leilani uh, and Bob and Celestia, and uh, we'll be checking in with her later. Glad to have L.E. and Barbara back with us for the season, the Wyricks. Glad to have you guys back safe after another mining season. Gary Scan uh, just handed me um, a prayer request on behalf of his ex-father-in-law, Fred. He is battling both uh, brain cancer and lung cancer, uh, so a difficult situation there. Uh, we'll put that in the bulletin, but we'll pray for, for Gary and, uh, and for Fred. The gardeners... Um, Praise God, it seems like they found uh, a new place to move into, so that's good news. I am correct, right? That's good. November 22nd, so this next Saturday at 10 a.m., uh, they will need some help moving. They currently live over off the Palmer Wasilla Highway by that new uh, car shop, Driven. Um, there's three bears. There's an elementary school there. They live in that location. Uh, so if you can show up there November 22nd, next Saturday at 10 a.m. Uh, call and let Nathan know ahead of time, but they'll need some help moving. Uh, let's lift up our brother Milrod in, in prayers. He's trying to sell his house, uh, and so pray that that, uh, that that sale goes through. Any other prayer requests that I, I don't have on my list here? Okay. All right, uh, be sure to grab a bulletin for all of the events that are coming up. Um, there is a lot. Uh, I'll emphasize mainly the Thanksgiving dinner, November 27th. There's a sign-up sheet in the back. Bonnie Merle is coordinating all of the food for that event, so be sure to sign up. If you have a talent or you think you have a talent, uh, talk to Mr. Crockett when he gets back uh, for our talent show. Beginning in December, check the bulletin, but there's lots of events, holiday events for families, for children. Uh, check the, the bulletin for those that are coming up. Since it is the end of the year, our lost and found items are going to be donated November 30th. Uh, there's a lot of coats downstairs by the lost and found, and so if you're missing a coat especially or anything else in the lost and found, check it out uh, before, before November 30th. One moment, let me grab my roster for next Sunday. I wasn't just going to get in line for lunch first. Um, I'm leading singing next Sunday, so I'll remember that. Dave Rambo is in charge of the Lord's Supper. Mike Katkus is preaching next Sunday. Clean up upstairs today. McMullen and Munsell. Downstairs, Miller and Merle. Did I miss any calendar announcements before we dismiss. Okay, thanks for being here today. You may be dismissed for lunch. <laughs>